delighted to be here. Today I'm going to cover several topics. I'll begin briefly with a definition of medical sociology. I'll describe our healthcare system. I'll talk about inequality in health and access to care. And finally conclude with a description of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act known as the Obamacare. Medical sociology uses sociology, which is the scientific study of society and human behavior. Medical sociology applies the perspectives, conceptualizations, theories, and methodologies of sociology to study health and illness. So what we do is to place health and disease in a social, cultural, and behavioral context. And as Dr. Cobbs mentioned, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the medical sociology section of the American Sociological Association, he published an extra issue of the Journal of Health and Social Behavior. It was entitled, What Do We Know? Key Findings from 50 Years of Medical Sociology. We received a generous grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to fund the extra issue. And it's available free online at that link oh, at the bottom. Thank you. And here's what it looks like. My co-editor was Eric Wright. Medical sociologists have several major findings when we look at the healthcare system. First of all, our healthcare system is very fragmented. Secondly, we have no national health insurance. Third, a significant number of individuals are uninsured. Fourth, our government insurance has gaps. And finally, our system is very expensive. We really have no health care system. It's a non-system. It's nothing nationwide, and it's very fragmented. Most people do not have a primary care doctor who takes care of 90% of their health care needs and make sure that they get referred to the appropriate people. Unless you're in a PPO or an HMO, you don't have this kind of coverage. And we're the only industrialized country in the whole world without a national health insurance program. We have many people who are uninsured. 50.7 million are uninsured. This is the latest data from the Kaiser Family Foundation. 700,000 of those are elderly. Most elderly, as you'll see, are covered under Medicare. That suggests that 19% of the non-elderly are uninsured. You'll see that in terms of income, 40% of those earning less than 100% of the federal poverty level, which I refer to as FPL and other slides, or those earning less than $22,350 are uninsured. This is of the non-elderly. <coughs> non yes. And of those who are non-elderly, 38 who are earning between 100% to 250%, of the federal poverty level, 38% are uninsured. 61% of those who are uninsured have a full-time worker, but they cannot afford insurance. And keep in mind that family policies through employers typically cost on average $13,770, and the worker pays about 30%. 16% of them reside in families with one or more part-time workers. 90% of the uninsured, again, these are all people who are under 65, are in low or moderate income families. That means they make less than 400% of the federal poverty level, or they make less than $89,406 for family of four. Young people are uninsured, about 19% of 19 to 29 year olds. And 81% of those who are uninsured are U.S. natives or naturalized citizens. It's pretty staggering. We do have three major health insurance programs that are funded by the government. 
Medicare, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program. And about 20% of Americans receive one of these benefits or they get care from the Veterans Administration. What I'm going to describe today are some of the gaps in coverage that exist. Medicare provides insurance for people who are 65 and older. Those with end-stage renal disease, in other words, those who are on kidney dialysis, and people with disabilities. And in 2010, it covered 45 million people. There are several parts to Medicare. Part A is mandatory. It covers hospital care, skilled nursing home care, some home health care. It's paid for by your payroll taxes. 1.5%. You contribute 1.5%. I'm sorry, 1.45% you contribute, and your employer matches that amount. And when you get your stubs from your pay, you can see where Medicare is um, deductible. It does have a deductible of over $1,000 for the first 60 days. In the hospital, this deductible increases as time goes on. If you're in the hospital for longer than that. Part B Medicare is voluntary, but almost all buy in, about 39,700. This covers physician services, both in the hospital and outside, outpatient care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, supplies, some home health care, lab tests, diagnostic tests, x rays, ambulance services, and blood numbers <coughs> supplied by Part A. It costs people this year $96.40 a month with $162 deductible. And every time you incur a service, it, you pay 20% of the cost as a co-payment. There is also... Oh, sorry, yes, sir. Is that $39 million? It's $39 million. Okay. It was covered by the um, picture, sorry. Part C covers managed care or private Key for service care that's coordinated. Part D covers drug prescriptions, but there's a donut hole problem we're going to talk about. People on average pay about $40.70 a month for drug coverage under Medicare. The main problem with Part D is referred to as the donut hole. For this year, for your first $310, subscribers pay all of it. So all your drugs are paid out of pocket. Up from $311 to $2,840, the patient pays 25% of the drug cost. But then comes the donut hole. So the patient in the donut hole this year, and this is because of the Health Care Reform Act, is 50% of brand name drug costs and 93% of generic drug costs. If you hit $6,448, you only pay 5% of your drug bill. Now, people say, gee, what difference does it make? Well, it must be different. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. What did it used to be in terms of it the used to be, and if you used to, It used to be that the patient paid everything in that donut hole. Doesn't this kind of give a perverse incentive for a patient to choose a brand name drug? No, the because the generic drug? drugs are so terribly cheap. And it makes the prescription will cost them five or ten dollars. It's not that much. Generic brands are incredibly cheap. I don't know. Ralph Tuck. No, no, I, I just I just priced out one recently and it wasn't all that cheap. Well, I understand it, but a lot of the drugs that the elderly are taking, generic drugs, are very cheap. And so paying 93% of them is much, much less expensive than paying for a brand name drug. Okay. I mean, maybe you can hold some of these questions so I can I have oh, a long sorry, presentation sorry. and then okay, okay. you know make a list of them and I'll be glad to answer okay. them. Okay? Thanks, Rob. So about 4 million people reach the donut hole. That's about 26% of people who have Part D prescription coverage. And what happens is they tend to either stop taking their medicine or they cut way back. 